Yeah, let's get started. Hi. <laughs> Hello, everybody. Thank you for coming out. Uh, if you have never seen us before, which is likely, uh, we have been here. I think this is our third MAGFest panel? Yes, yeah, our third. Yeah. Third? Cool. Uh, we're live from the apocalypse, collectively. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> sure, yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> Uh, yeah, we uh, are a not-for-profit TTRPG studio, question mark. We make actual play content like streams and podcasts uh, to raise money for nonprofits and aid organizations and other important causes like that. Uh, we do stream on Twitch. Uh, we do edit some of those streams into podcasts and put them out there into the world, but we don't make any money off of it uh, intentionally. Um, instead, we try to encourage people to uh, donate to uh, whatever cause we're platforming. We're currently... Raising money for Doctors Without Borders, which uh, we uh, right. we just started our fundraising push for them. Um, if you don't know them, uh, I don't know where you been? But uh, <laughs> they've been around for like 70 years. Uh, they're active all over the place wherever there are uh, humanitarian crises. They are offering medical aid. Uh, currently, they are uh, very active uh, in uh, Gaza, and we are very uh, proud to be able to support the work that they are doing there. So yeah, we do a lot of streams, we play a lot of teacher RPGs. Collectively, we have been doing this for like 80, 80 years, I think. We've all been doing this yeah, for like 20 like years, that. roughly. Something like that, yep. Uh, which is terrifying um, to say out loud. Uh, we, yes, many games are popping up. Uh, these are the games, some of them, that we have done. Uh, they don't all have logos, but the ones that do are up there. We've been doing this since... This isn't even all the freaking logos. It's true. Yeah. This is 2020. 2020? Is that true? Yeah, mm -hmm. that sounds right. <laughs> uh, we counted it up, and we have done 64 games, uh, not sessions, but actual games, including one-shots. So after this panel, uh, you can catch us next door running five one-shots in rapid succession. Um, <laughs> gotta get those numbers. Gotta get those numbers up there. Uh, but yeah, that is, uh, that's us, pretty much. Um, we're not going to talk about those games. <laughs> no. Uh, but if you want to know more information, you can find us at livefromtheapocalypse.com, twitch.tv slash livefromtheapocalypse, uh, pretty much everywhere under that handle. Um, do we want to introduce ourselves? Yeah, we could do that. I think you're still too far from the mic, but maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> it's, it's, it's because I'm trying to talk to you. It's all right. Fine. Works if I'm talking this way? Yeah. Okay. All right. I just will not look at any of my co-panelists Please at don't. any point throughout this presentation. Sick, nasty. Yeah, okay, um. cool. Uh, I can go first, I guess. Hello. Hi, my name is Will. I'm one of the storytellers at Life from the Apocalypse. I'm one of the co-founders, I guess. I use he, him pronouns, and I guess that's the stuff. I don't know. You can street pass me on your 3DS. Uh, <laughs> I'll be the one that says uh, Google cops 40% for more info. <laughs> well... <laughs> Hey, I'm Andrew, also he, him, another co-founder of Life in the Apocalypse, running games forever, and I love talking about them and doing game stuff, playing games, all that stuff. Makes me very happy. Uh, I am Della, also one of the co-founders of Life from the Apocalypse and one of the GMs there. Um, I have been uh, also running and playing in games for the past 20 years or so, and um, it's great. I love to rant about uh, story. Uh, and I am Brendan. Um, I'm, I'm not one of the founders. I am just here. I'm just a guy. Uh, He's I, lying. <laughs> I didn't. I didn't found it. I came in later. Uh, but in a uh, way, we all found it. You know, <laughs> we found him. <laughs> but I am a. Uh, I am. A, I am a GM with Life in the Apocalypse. Uh, I also do some professional game mastering on the side. Uh, I have been doing tabletop RPGs. 20, 24, God, twenty four years at this point. LARPing for like 20, uh, used, to, used to work at an escape room for several years, been, done, a lot of, done a lot of things in that, in, in that kind of space, uh, do a lot of freelance game development as well. Um, and yeah, that's kind of, that's kind of it. Um, so the gist of this presentation is, like you said, Schrodinger's crit, how to ignore rules the right way. Trying to, you know, that, 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 that age-old argument of like, should you fudge that die roll? behind the DM screen or not. Uh, do, what, what do you do when you feel like the rules are encumbering the game? Uh, and we're, we're going to present a lot of different perspectives on that uh, and different 
ways, I, th I think we're not gonna give you a single answer to that question. We're, what we would like to do here is to present you with a, 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 a toolkit that you could potentially use for for grappling with this problem that is uh, as as old as we have been doing RPGs essentially. Uh, and I think that first perspective, uh, we're going to uh, go to Malkus again on the end with why even rules though. Yeah, uh, hundred percent. Why? Why even rules? Uh, so. Depending on your level of familiarity with uh, TTRPGs, whether you are just starting to get into it or whether you've been doing it for a long time, whether you have mostly played Dungeons and Dragons, whether you've played other more like indie games, uh, you may have uh, varying familiarity with rules and rule systems. Uh, TTRPGs, uh, like Brendan was saying, an age old debate is how much do the rules matter? Uh, are the rules even necessary? And you will find some radical dungeon master, certainly not myself, uh, who would argue that the, the rules are more of a convenient structure than anything else and are not inherently necessary to telling a cool, interesting story. Um, and I think that there are a lot of shows out there now. If, if uh, actual play media has become much more of a thing, I think like the first Adventure Zone uh, arc is a pretty good example of this, where it was still very entertaining. It still pulled lots of people into the hobby, and they had no idea what the fuck they were doing. And they were very candid about that fact. Um, so yeah, I mean, a basic rule, uh, no rule but cool. Uh, the rule of cool is something you may have heard before, which basically uh, is shorthand for this idea that if it's cool, that's more important than what is written down in the book. So if somebody is about to do something that is very cool, uh, the last thing I personally would want to do as a storyteller is roadblock that thing from happening just because I don't know how it would work within the narrative framework of the game itself. Um, and similarly, uh, with uh, rolling dice and things like that, there are a ton of games out there now that don't even use dice rolling mechanics. Dread is one that comes to mind, which is a very uh, a personal favorite of mine. If you're not familiar with Dread, it's a horror system where instead of rolling dice when you want to accomplish something, you pull a block from a Jenga tower. Uh, and then if the Jenga tower falls, your character dies. Cause a lot of stress. Uh, yep. And, uh, and uh, that's a great system. It builds tension in a really interesting way. It does not involve rolling dice at all. And like, is there a high degree of, uh, for failure? Yeah, there is a very high potential for failure, but that fits the genre of a horror game very well. Um, and, uh, and, and I'm a big fan of games like that in general, um, which means that now I get to pull up my two notes. <laughs> um, so yeah, other, other good examples uh, of why do we even need rules? Um, so one thing that I wanted to talk about as a storyteller that I feel very passionately about is this, uh, is this idea of failure and how it interacts with the game itself, um, right? Because the traditional model and, and especially how a lot of people are introduced to the hobby is you're playing Dungeons and Dragons, you want to accomplish something, you roll a d20, you get a five or whatever, and then you don't get to do that thing. Uh, <laughs> depending on how bad... Uh, I shouldn't say that. Depending on <laughs> your storyteller, um, you may like get uh, sort of like uh, jeered at also, um, which sucks in my opinion. And uh, I've had that experience before. And nothing pulls me out of the experience of trying to pretend to be an epic hero faster than someone being like, oh, wow. I mean, you really suck. You dropped your sword. Like, that's so embarrassing. Um, so uh, one thing that I always like to do as a storyteller is to crowdsource failure as a concept. So if you happen to fail a role, uh, if I'm running the game, one thing that I am more likely to do is say, uh, what do you think? Like, you, you fail. You're not going to be able to do this. What do you think happens? And that puts the uh, power into your hand to decide what happens to your character. Uh, if you want to drop your sword, by all means. I'm not going to tell you you can't do that. Who am I? I'm nobody. Um, but uh, yeah, so crowdsourcing that, that failure. Uh, I mean, crowdsource everything is one piece of GM advice that I would give. Like, talk to your table uh, ahead of time, during the session, after the session. See what they think is most interesting. See what you're interested in as far as tone is concerned. Um, and, uh, and, and along those same lines, it's totally fine as a storyteller, GM, whatever term you want to use, to 
not have a, uh, to not know everything, to not remember everything that has happened in a past session, to ask the group to remind you how the last session ended, uh, or like to, to correct you on a bit of information that you uh, misquoted uh, yourself on when you like gave them a letter three sessions ago. Uh, <laughs> So don't be afraid, again, not something that I would ever do or have ever done, um, but like, yeah, don't be afraid. The chances are at any table you run for, someone is going to be a note taker, and like that person as a storyteller is gonna be your best friend, uh, if you listen to them, if you make it clear that they are welcome to tell you when you are wrong and to jump in and correct you. Uh, and if you don't have somebody who's taking notes, don't be afraid to ask if somebody is interested in doing that because that will save you a lot of time and a lot of, uh, and a lot of embarrassment and a lot of blank faces staring back at you when you uh, do the wrong accent for an NPC or something like that. Again, just pulling random examples out of nowhere here. Entirely um, random examples. I'm, I'm feeling really personally attacked by that last one, actually. Listen, we've all been there. We've all done it. Uh, in my games? The, no, difference, <laughs> the difference is that our sessions live on the internet forever. <laughs> right. Everyone can see them. Everyone right now. can see us when we fuck up. Every mistake is archived. 100%. So, um, yeah, rules can be convenient, but what I would say, what I would caution people with as the final part of this is to just, um, I don't have people, I don't have players roll dice uh, in most of the games that I run unless the outcome would be interesting. Uh, if somebody is like trying to climb a wall and they are a really good acrobat or something like that, I'm not going to make them roll that. That's a thing that they can do. If the stakes are high, if like uh, they're trying not to alert a guard, if they are actively being observed and they don't know it or something like that, at that point I might ask them to roll. But if failure is not going to further the story or result in something interesting happen, I don't think it's worth having them roll the die. I don't think it's worth putting them in the position of compromising the vision they have of their character with failure just to uh, kill time, essentially. So that's the number one uh, piece of advice that I would give as far as why even rules are concerned. I don't think everybody up here agrees with me entirely, which brings us to... Rules. Good, actually. Uh, also, in before, I know that's uh, technically a misquotation of what he actually said, but I'm doing a bit. <laughs> so, uh, I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm going to be kind of here a little bit on the opposite end of the spectrum to play uh, sort of devil's advocate for... F an advocate for mechanics in our games. Um, I think a... I had this all structured out in my head. Uh, so I feel like everyone has here probably encountered the phrase at some point, uh, role play, don't role play. Uh, that, as, uh, as an aphorism, has been around, I mean, at least as long as I have been gaming. Um, and I'm sure it is older than that. And in, in particular, I think in the last... Um, the last ten, the last ten years or so, um, there has been kind of a, a, a an undercurrent uh, in discussion of uh, role playing games uh, in the discourse, if you will, uh, that the less mechanics your game has, that the the more narrative it is, uh, that the more objectively better it is, the closer to this like platonic ideal of a role-playing game it is. And I, 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 I reject that thesis entirely. Um, I personally think that rules are actually integral to the experience of playing an RPG. Uh, to, to me, it, it is the G in the RPG. Uh, and now, absolutely, people go into RPGs for different things. People get different things out of it. There are people who, for whom the rules are a thing they just sort of have to deal with in order to get the joy out of the role-playing and the collaborative storytelling. And that is absolutely valid. Uh, I love rules-light systems. Uh, I've, I've played in essentially all but rule-less systems and, and really, really enjoyed it. Um, but there are also people who come to this hobby because they like mechanics. They, they like the systems that are involved in it and the interactions of those within the game. And that is, similarly, an entirely valid way to play the game. They are not playing incorrectly. And I think that the 
mechanics in games are essentially kind of what make it interesting. Uh, it is, and we'll talk a little bit later about uh, kind of like uncertainty as narrative. Um, Malkus mentioned earlier about uh, you know only calling for a die roll if you think that it would be dramatically interesting for for that to occur, and I definitely completely agree with that. In part because uh, I feel that mechanics introduce a level of uncertainty into the experience that is difficult to replicate through just pure collaboration. There is a, a sort of a, a, a visceral uh, feeling that we get uh, as, as humans waiting to see what the result of that die roll is going to be. In that, that, that moment, that moment where it could be a 1, it could be a 20, it could be anything in between. That, that Schrodinger's crit, if you will. <laughs> uh, and, and we will also talk later about sort of what what those numbers actually mean and uh, how, how what those numbers mean are, uh, can, can be flexible. But arguing for the, the presence of uncertainty and of introducing that, that mechanistic element to your game. Uh, and now similar to what Marcus was saying earlier, when you are choosing to ask for a die roll uh, because you want to see if it's going to make it interesting. You also then uh, need to be prepared to deal with whatever result comes out of that. Uh, like, if, for example, if this you want this to be a really long shot action, like you don't really necessarily want them to be able to succeed spectacularly at this. But if you give them that die roll, you have placed the power into their hands. If they get that nat 20, you need to be able to be prepared to, to roll with that. Because if you, if you no-sell that result as, as a DM, if you have not respected the results of that, that uncertainty you decided to introduce, then that kind, that kind of ruins the immersion. It ruins the experience. It ruins that feeling of agency that you have just yanked back from the player. At the same time, uh, you need to be prepared for what's going to happen if they fail at something that you expected them to or even potentially wanted them to succeed at. Um, and uh, I'm, I'm going to try and uh, briefly tell, uh, in as compact a way as possible, a very long-winded anecdote about uh, a time that that happened to me as a DM, but that I am so glad that it did. Um, one of my players in a long-running game was working towards a, a major character goal. Um, uh, to be specific for all you goths out there, this was Vampire the Masquerade. Uh, it was a, a years-long campaign out of character, ran for centuries in character. They were working towards Golconda, a state of like vampire enlightenment that almost never comes up in a regular game. Uh, and after over a year of working towards this out of character, we finally had a one-on-one -on -one session where he was going to go through his final trial you're only ever allowed to, to, to do once. And we went through it. It was great role play. Everything happened. And in that moment, I could have chosen to just give it to him. And part of me wanted to. But I decided that I wanted there to be some kind of stakes. So I decided to give him a die roll uh, for it, a final die roll. Uh, it was a very forgiving die roll. Uh, I, I, I wanted him to succeed at it. I, I, I gave him a die roll with a lot of advantages. And he didn't just fail. He botched. And again, I, in that moment, had, had, had a choice to make. I honestly kind of wanted him to succeed. I, as, as a DM, I wanted him to succeed. He'd been working at this so hard, both in character and like out of character. But I had made that choice. I chose to introduce that uncertainty. If I then turned around and just said, uh, or like tried to figure out some other way to give him an extra re-roll, at that point, did it just become a gimme? Would that just cheapen what he had worked so hard to achieve? So I decided to 
let the dice lie. And he failed. For reasons that he did not understand and would never understand. And going into the last act of that game, that was the best thing that could have possibly happened. It really altered the arc of his character and the way that he interacted with the rest of the world and with the other characters in a way that was so interesting and so compelling and something that I did not see coming at all when I was planning that game. And because I decided to, to call for a die roll, a single die roll, that that game ended up being one of the best and most memorable games that I have ever run. And the last thing that I think I will say on that, uh, uh, as I've already uh, rambled on qu quite, quite too long at this, is uh, I am personally a big fan of mechanics as narrative. There are a lot of things that you can pull from looking at the rules, from the implications of things in the rules. Like, if you really read into some of the rules of, like, various effects in different games or different spells and such in Dungeons & Dragons or certain things that, that are creating assumptions about how the metaphysics or the essential facts of reality work, that they may seem silly or inconsistent when you first read them because, again, there, there are things that are written to accomplish a specific thing in a specific context they're not necessarily intended to like establish some sort of binding cosmic precedent. But the implication is there. And all of those things are potentially very interesting plot hooks to explore. If you want to assume that that does represent some sort of an inherent cosmic truth. Uh, one weird off-the-wall example uh, is uh, the ceremony spell in Dungeons and Dragons 5th edition. Uh, one of the things that it does is marriage. Uh, you get mechanical benefits for marriage. There is no limit on the number of times you can get married. As long as, I think, within, like, what, like, only once per day, I think. Uh, at the same time, there exists no mechanism to reverse that or undo it. In essence, the, what this says is that the gods of Dungeons and Dragons recognize multiple marriage. They do not recognize divorce. <laughs> what does that mean? A fantastic question. Let's find out together. Uh, but uh, obviously there are also a lot of weird mechanical implications in Dungeons and Dragons because of, again, the way that it is designed. Uh, so many of the mechanics of Dungeons and Dragons, as sort of the household name, which we'll talk about a lot because obviously it's the big thing. Um, so many of its mechanics are designed to reward and incentivize specifically theft and murder. <laughs> Don't keep it I love Dungeons and Dragons. I've been playing it for 20 plus years. Uh, but it's a theft and murder simulator when you really, really <laughs> boil it down. Uh, but what you choose to do with those incentives and these, these mechanics is up to you. Uh, I'm assuming everyone here is, at least some people here have played Baldur's Gate recently, right? Yes, all right. So you roll those dice. There's that moment of anticipation when you're waiting to see what that number is going to be, that Schrodinger's crit. And then... My God, he said the name of the panel. Twice. Twice! Twice. <laughs> look, I, look, I, look, when I came up with this pun, I was really proud of it, okay? <laughs> Validate me. If you say it a third time, we summon something. <laughs> uh, and then it comes up, and it doesn't matter whether it was a natural one. It doesn't matter whether it was ten under your target number. It doesn't matter whether it was one under your target number. It plays a little disappointing sound effect. <laughs> the little pew. <laughs> Does it? What it the does. Fuck? <laughs> it does. It's That's the awful. worst. Which wow. brings us, I think, candidly into the next section of our panel, which is okay. So, what even are numbers, though? All right, my turn. So, hey, first of all, thank you all for being here. There's a ton of people, and that makes me very happy because if you're not here, we're just talking to empty rooms. So, you all rock. Um, that said, I'm going to go into mechanics but interpreting numbers differently, right? Because I don't believe in fudging dice, right? This, I'll get there, trust me. It sounds crazy, but it all comes around, right? But a lot of people fall into the trap of the binary success or failure when dice are rolled. 
D and D is really really bad about this. Some systems like Powered by the Apocalypse have a middle ground of you know uh, failure, uh, success at cost, right, or partial successes that I think integrates really well. And so I like taking that idea and adopting it in a way where if you're running a more binary pass fail system, you can still have successes and move the plot along, even though someone rolls a nat one. So I'm gonna ask a question and just show hands, right? GMs or players, and I've done this, I'm guilty of it. Who's ever been in a scenario where you either want to give your players something or you as a player need something to move the plot forward, a skill check or a role is called for, that role has failed, and everyone sits at the table looking at each other going, how do I push this forward now? How do I deliver this information? Or the player going, oh, what happens next? Who's, who's ever had that experience? Yeah, it's infuriating, right? It sucks. Um, I've done it to my players. I've had it done to me. feels bad. Right, So one of the things I try to look at in situations like that where, hey, this check is called for, because if there's no reason for the check, give them the information and move the plot along. But, okay, there's a skill involved, there's some sort of persuasion, there's something that has to resolve before this information is given. Okay, check introduced, we have uncertainty. They fail, okay. Does the failure mean they don't get the information, or does the failure mean now there's more cost and problems with how that went down? Prime example, right? Let's say they're going into a bar because they're trying to elicit some information from somebody to move the plot along because they're looking for a name or a hook, right? They go in, they try and sweet talk somebody who's there, they botch, right? Some systems have a push your luck mechanic, some systems have a reroll mechanic, they try again, they botch again, right? So now it's gone from a persuasion to a bit of an argument, right? They're trying to like fast talk these gangsters and the gangsters are like, nope, I'm not telling you nothing, right? Now they're mad, okay. This is now resulted in the gangsters take you out back and beat the crap out of you and say, you stay out of Mr. Malone's business, right? Cool, on a series of failures, you got a name. You also have some hit point damage, you know, or some sort of mechanical hindrance from what occurred to your character in that little back alley scrap but the plot moves forward even on a series of dramatic failures that otherwise would just hinder momentum, right? That's what I mean by looking at dice rolls differently. Okay, and that one isn't, you don't get the information, it's this is gonna hurt, right? But we're still gonna move forward because consequences is, is keeps reliable narrative structure, which Dell is gonna talk about more. The second piece I wanna talk about for- See so if I can jump in real quick. Yeah, just just to add on to that, uh, one of the talk, circling back to talking about failure, failure in any type of storytelling is always an opportunity for something. So one of the ways that I like to interpret failure uh, as opportunity is, uh, but don't make the. I talked about this a little bit earlier, but like don't make the player feel inferior. Use it as an opportunity to make the bad guy, the opposition, really, really good, like really strong, really threatening, really smart, whatever. Don't downplay someone's character, upplay your NPCs. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Like Andy was because saying, I think we're, 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 all, we're all a big fan of the philosophy of failing forward. Uh, also, also failing with style. Uh, yes. Like Malcolm was saying earlier, being able to put failure in the hands yes, of the player so, so that uh, they can choose how they kind of want that failure to present itself. Uh, they're also, the, obviously, we play a lot of like Powered by the Apocalypse systems where those in, inherently have a sort of a, a middle range of success, like a mixed success threshold. Games like D&D don't. They have a DC where it's a binary success or a failure. But what we're saying is there's, there's no reason why you can't choose to essentially introduce mixed successes into systems which otherwise only have a binary success or failure. Now that helps out a lot, and that actually goes into the next piece of this, which is you want your characters to do cool things, right? You want them to be awesome, powerful heroes, you want them to have great successes. And so rule of cool should always be in effect, but there's variables and ways to look at it, right? Obviously, if you're looking at a character and they're like, hey, this is an ability I have, I wanna use it, it's gonna be awesome, heck yeah, let it fly, let them do something epic, because that's, that's the perfect time for it. But then you start getting a little wibbly wobbly and people start pitching, well, I have an ability that kind of does this and maybe an adjacent effect that's not listed anywhere in the rules might work. I'll give you an example. I had a player who had a scroll of heat metal 
who wanted to basically weld a door shut to stop a bunch of orcs that were about to come charging in. Now, for any of you who read that spell description, it doesn't do that at all. And I said that at the table, but I was like, you know what, that is a cool idea, though, and it's close enough to what this does that, okay, you're burning a resource, I'll give it to you. Or, hey, I'll give it to you at cost or at a, at a skill check of some type because that's a neat idea and it's close enough to the original intent of the thing that it's clever outside the box thinking, let's roll with it. And then, of course, there's the last tier of that where the ability is, or the thing they're asking for is so far-fetched and away from what they could do as a character or what the rules would support. It's okay to say no at that point, right? Now, does it have to be a flat no? Not necessarily. You can say no, but, right? Hey, I want to summon a Gundam to come fight for me. Now, you have, there's nothing in your character sheet lets you do, do that at all. That's crazy. But you can go through and build one in a plot arc. There are ways for you to do that, but not in this moment instantaneously right now, right? So get, and it creates a long-term goal. So those are things that kind of enable both numbers, rolling, and what people can do to have great success, even not necessarily based in the mechanics, and still move forward even if they fail. Uh, the most important question to ask on failure is if they're going to move forward, hey, what are you willing to give up to move forward? What does this cost your character? What resource, what, what uh, setback? What do you think is a reasonable thing to pay to move the bar forward, right? Don't be crazy about it, but just within the confines of the scene, right? Hey, I'm gonna get the information, but I'm gonna get thrown out of here and blacklisted. It'll never be allowed back. Fair, you know what? This is a place you frequent. That's an actual punishment for your character. Trade off, right? So or, things like that to think about. Or you above the table, how much are they willing to give you? That's true. Mm -hmm. Fiscally. Yeah. How many snacks we, do you have? We are all <laughs> open to bribes. I'm always open to bribes. It's not one, but you got cupcakes. <clears throat> all right, you're fine. <laughs> um, but the important part of all that is that it lets you have mechanical structure and work within the confines of the narrative. Because at the end of the day, the rules are helpful, but they structure the game and narrative in a way that they remain consistent. Because even if the rules get a little wibbly wobbly, narrative uh, consistency or continuity is the most important because otherwise you're going to get weird whiplash in the world and that breaks immersion. And that kind of leads into your thing. Sure does. Hi, I'm Della Collins and I have never read a rule book in my life. <laughs> I hate reading rule books. People have given me so many rule books. I have, I own so many rule books. I will not read any of them. I gave you a book Some yesterday. Of it's these, true. He gave me a rule book for my birthday yesterday. And thank you very much. That was very kind of you. Actually, oh, also, can we say happy birthday, Della? Oh, yeah, it is my birthday today. Yay! I am too old. Uh, the, the fact is, you don't need to read a rule book. You need to know how to use an index. You need to uh, know where to look for the rules. You need to be able to search a wiki. You do not need to read a rule book cover to cover. If the idea of doing that is like sticking pins under your fingernails, don't do it. If that's what's holding you back is like, oh, I don't have an encyclopedic knowledge of the rules, fuck it. Read everything else instead. Good fiction will teach you more about narrative consistency and about how to plot a game and how to move forward through a story than anything else. Good nonfiction will teach you more about engagement and getting people invested than even good fiction. These are the things you should read. Good fiction, good nonfiction. If reading is hard, listen to audiobooks. If audiobooks are hard, watch movies. Think about what works and what doesn't. If you have the opportunity, actually engage with different versions of a single property. See what adapts and what doesn't. The role-playing space is different than the film space, is different than the novel space, is different than the graphic novel space. And watching how these various formats interact with one another can teach you a lot about what works narratively through each uh, through line. For example, in writing a novel, 
random chance should almost never favor your main character. That just doesn't work. That doesn't work for a novel. It feels cheap. In a role-playing game, sometimes you need random chance to favor your PCs because otherwise they will ignore the plot because Mm -hmm. they have decided that they have abducted Boblin the Goblin and they're fully invested in Boblin the Goblin's health and well-being and are completely ignoring Strahd, who is fucking shit up. Can we... uh... Can we go to the Boblin slide, please? <laughs> I wish we had one. So get familiar with your genre. Get familiar with the rules and tropes of your genre. Get familiar with other genres so that you can pull them in. Get uncomfortable with your reading. Read weird shit. That's going to get you so much more information about narrative. But as we say here, m- most of all, read the room. And this actually is a message for players, not just GMs. There are two things that we hear from GMs all the time that are the most aggravating for players. The first is the refusal of the call to action. How many people here, I see I see some people rolling their eyes like, oh, God, that guy. Because mm-hmm. everybody's got that guy in their gaming group. Some of us have been that guy in our gaming group. We, were all, we were all teenagers once. We were all teenagers once. Um, the problem with the refusal to the call to action is it, there's no story there. And if you have made a character who just wouldn't do that, you've made a bad character. There are ways to be the reluctant hero, but not refuse the call to action. There is a great example from that is available to watch on uh, the Live from the Apocalypse YouTube channel in Class Reunion, run by Will Malkus, of a character who is very reluctant to respond to the call to action of a government official saying, hey, Come work for me. Be spies. This character very understandably says, so I've been doing crime in this city for a very long time. I plan to continue doing crime in this city. I'm really not sure that taking up even a vague law enforcement position is going to work for me. Through the narrative, that character talks to other characters who say... Basically, what's the worst that could happen? Uh, and uh, alternately, yeah, but now you'll have a badge that you can flash at people and be like, no, I'm a super cop. You can't tell me to not do crime. Um, and uh, I, See again, read nonfiction. Uh, yes. <laughs> yes. As, as this is my game, I would just like to jump in and just say that they're not cops, they're spies, ACAB all day. Uh, <laughs> I'm sorry, ACAB includes the CIA, so... No, 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 spies. Like fun spies. Like fun spies. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's fine. It's fine. Uh, They're having fun. Um, I think that's actually a lie. I think they're all miserable right now, but (laughs) it's D&D. That's what it's about. Um, So eventually they're able to talk this character into it, both uh, in character and potentially out of character, by working with the player and the GM to find out, okay, what are the hooks that could get your character to do these things? Sometimes we do make bad characters. I think we've also all had the experience of having made the wrong character for the story, where we walk in and we've made the coolest cyberpunk like hacker guy, and we do zero net running. And our cool little net runner is... Just sort of like, he, here I am. I got, I got my, I can, I could log in at some point, but I got nothing else. I can do nothing else. Which is, I will be honest, one of my problems with cyberpunk as a genre. This is also um, why session zero is super important. It'll save you a lot of time, headache. Oh my gosh, yes. An important thing in doing session zeros is. Deciding what kind of story you want to tell with your players. What is the story we're telling? And that will allow you to establish and help your players understand the stakes of the story, which will help them understand the stakes and consequences of the decisions they've made. Sometimes it happens we can't know 
No one person knows everything about the world in which they live, and no player is going to know everything that their character knows about the world in which they live. Sometimes we will make decisions as players that our characters would not have made because we do not have perfect information about the world and setting. Uh, ask me about a war I kicked off once accidentally by making a marriage proposal that the GM was not anticipating. And he did not let me walk back from. <laughs> Sometimes you should maybe let your characters, players walk things back is all I'm saying. <laughs> So be honest regarding consequences and ask your players, you know, are you sure, are you sure, vampire affected by Rot Shrek, do you want to pick up the flaming sword? Are you sure? <laughs> the other big problem we see a lot of in gaming is metagaming. People using context and knowledge they have out of character in character. I don't think metagaming is necessarily a problem as long as it's moving things forward. It becomes a problem when it's breaking immersion in certain ways. And I think one of the reasons why we metagame as players is because we want to win. We're all role-playing because we want to be so much cooler than we are in the real world. Like, we want our lives to be big and epic and fantastic. And so, yeah, we're going to use this extra information. I would say, though, that sometimes using that external, informa that external information damages and cheapens the story. It can be better to think of these things in terms of dramatic irony. There is no story. There is, if, if Macbeth knows... That Macduff was from his mother's womb untimely ripped. Spoilers for Macbeth. Spoilers for Macbeth. <laughs> <laughs> there is no play. There is no uh, tension to that battle for us as the audience. Embrace the tension of uh, embrace the tension of these things. If uh, Brendan made this point earlier when we were talk uh, just chatting. If there is a secret and it never comes up, does it matter? It doesn't. So talk about those things outside the table. Let it be a secret in character, but let it come up. Knowing about these things externally and allowing them to come up, um, allowing them to arise in story is so good that it lets you kind of anticipate it, and that makes it that makes that little revelation so much better. I'm, I'm a big fan of having uh, open secrets uh, at a table uh, yes. and, and in a game. Um, and obviously, it depends a little bit on the kind of game that you're playing. Um, but e even if you're playing a game where secrets are big and secrets matter, uh, I think as what Della had said in that same conversation was that the thing that matters about a secret is the reveal. And if there's no reveal, then really what was, what was the purpose of it? And I, that is a kind of metagaming. It's a kind of metagaming for, for good, I would say. Is, uh, and a part of, as Della was saying, uh, establishing a shared understanding of what consequences could be and being honest about consequences. Uh, so that then when failure does occur you don't feel like you need to fudge that die roll. Mm -hmm. You don't feel like you need to fudge the result because everyone is on the same page about what failure means and what consequences are. Um, and that could be good also for being able to help sort of uh, almost kind of like metagame to a degree, uh, degree kind of like peeking behind the curtain and like working an angle like you would in, say, wrestling. Um, mm. Or uh, in turn... Oh, this, one right, this happens to me every panel. I'm like mid-sentence, and the thought goes directly out of my brain. Mm. Mm -hmm. See, the thing about wrestling... <laughs> <laughs> this is a wrestling panel now. Think about panels. Yes. Think about panels. <laughs> the meta panel. No, right? I would, I, I would I, actually go so far as to say that a secret without a reveal is just a gotcha. Yeah. And that's not fun yeah. for anybody involved. And I think the, the, the last thing I want to say on, on this is that a big... Uh, another important part as a GM and as a player, is to accept feedback um, because so much about whether or not your players are going to accept failure 
uh, so that they're not fudging dice rolls, so they're not doing metagaming, so they feel comfortable doing all of this stuff, is knowing that you as a GM are not there to fuck them over. Mm -hmm. And so if you as a GM are accepting feedback, and so when they come to you and say, like, hey, that call you made did not I don't like I don't I didn't like it that didn't feel great you can still defend your call and say like okay how do we want to handle situations like that in the future you know how does that how's that going to work out you can doing that collaboratively and understanding that as a player that your dice rolls are not the end of the narrative can be really, really important in helping everybody embrace both the mechanics and the narrative rules. Yep. Fa- failure doesn't need to be the end of an action. Failure is more often than not the beginning of another action. And I remembered what I was going to say, which was that uh, in terms of again, being honest about consequences, understanding consequences, so that you don't feel like you have to, the fudge die rolls and fudge results is allowing your character to make bad decisions that we we all like we were saying we all want to play these very cool very interesting characters who are very competent and good at all of the things that they do um but it's so much fun to play a fuck up well but at the same time then you, you can run the situation of sort of like refusing refusing the call to adventure or refusing the plot hook to a degree where because your character is very competent and they're very they're very good at things and they're good at assessing things and they see that this may not be the best logical thing to do in the situation or that they want may want to try and spend two entire sessions trying to plan out another way to fight this goddamn dragon with the rest of the party. But while it is important, I think, to be paranoid as RPG characters, uh, it is important that that paranoia not uh, turn into risk aversion. Because again, talking about uncertainty creating the stakes of the narrative, if there is no risk, then there is no story. And why are we playing? Yep. But I only want to do it if I can win. No? Mm-hmm. Okay. Mm-hmm. Um, well, I... I... Sorry, good. <laughs> no, I'm good. You go ahead, no. buddy. Fair enough? You sure? Okay. Now, so one, last, one last thing on failure, and then I want to try to open up the questions uh, if you were good. So talking about that wibbly-wobbly of interpretation of dice rolls, right? This happened recently in a campaign that I'm running that Dell is in. Um, rolled a perception check to overhear some information. Rolled a solid four. Right? So. Extremely solid for Yeah. Just putting up numbers, right? So, okay, failure. Absolutely didn't perceive the thing, but that's boring. So instead, actually overheard a conversation between a mage and a security guard in an area, right? And got some tidbits of kind of ponderous information that led to further plot, which is good. But also in that moment on the floor, the security guard noticed her character and it was like hey i noticed you're kind of being nosy don't right so now the character's on security guard's radar that professor has gone missing it has spurred an entire plot line and that was all from that initial overheard conversation because otherwise her character would have gone to meet the professor they wouldn't have been around and the key piece of context for where they went and what happened or at least the initial breadcrumb wouldn't have been there so it's like oh i guess they're not around Moving on, right? So that's what I mean by saying, like, the failure comes from you have a security guard who now is watching your character and has raised the stakes for a future poking around. All I'm saying is, why would a a six-and-a-half-foot-tall human security guard be threatening a a two-and-a-half-foot-tall gnome? Because he's an asshole. (laughs) What a dick. Because he's a cop. Uh, But, well, I think that is probably as good a segue as uh, any into Q&A. <laughs> joke, joke for the real ones in the audience. All right. Heck yeah. Fire it up. So, uh, me about the situation where you thought you did something, you think you should have, and uh, regret it, and then I'll welcome back with the change of 
Just, just to repeat the question for the audience, uh, if, I've, if I heard it correctly, is there a situation where we have or have not fudged a die roll, but we regret that decision? Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah, I, I, have, I can think of a lot of examples for this because as the as the representative uh, rules suck, you don't need rules person here. <laughs> I, I used to have very loose opinions about fudging dice rolls, and it was something as a GM that I did all the time, uh, to be honest. Like if, if uh, mostly to benefit the players because I approach storytelling from a very like narrative focus uh, and tended to fall into this into this feeling of like, uh, okay, cool, so they're like fighting a dragon, and if they roll badly on this, that's really gonna like drag the story to a halt. That's really gonna suck. I, I don't wanna see that happen. So uh, I'm gonna lower this armor class by like, you know, two points. That's gonna be enough to hit. Uh, I'm just gonna like knock off these last five hit points. Like they're close enough. Um, and it, it, it getting away from that has proven to not only result in more interesting stories, because again, when you give, when you like sort of hand these opportunities for failure to your players, you will be surprised how often they choose to fuck up. Uh, <laughs> like, like, like real life, real life sucks, it's hard. You know what's worse? Fucking up in real life. That's also something people want to explore in like a safe space and like a safe narrative uh, framework. Um, so by moving myself away from that, I also, uh, it also resulted in me being able to tell more interesting stories because it presents more of a challenge for me as the storyteller, a way to like, how do I keep the, the narrative on track? How do I keep the story interesting and dynamic and not let it grind to a halt, even though they didn't necessarily succeed on this specific attack? Uh, and that's an exercise for GMs that I would encourage you to try out. I'll say one additional thing on that. So I don't have an antidote for a specific moment, but in the past I have done wibbly wobbly actual fudge on dice rolls, didn't like what it was resulting in. And for those who've seen any of the Dimension 20 content, the box of doom, right? Basically getting pulled out for high stakes rolls. I love that. So anytime there's a high stakes like saving throw or skill check of some type, I'll make the saving throw out in the open for the players so they can see it. It's not every roll, but it's the big ones, right? Because one, that creates a good sense of satisfaction when the players crush it, and two, it preserves integrity so that if they fail it, it's not me behind the scene going, oh yeah, you fail because the monster's too cool, right? It's just, hey, dice were what, they, what the dice were, it's okay, reset and go again. And I think that also helps build table trust as, uh, as an additional benefit. Do you have a question? Yeah, what's up? Player character deaths, right? Like, it's a pretty big topic, and I'm just kind of curious. Like, is there a limit to like as GMs, like where you would fudge to avoid that if, for any reason, or not? Or do you think it's just better to just let it happen and move the story with the death? Oh, so, uh, but just I, to repeat the question for everyone, uh, rules and character death uh, always a spicy topic. Mm -hmm. um, uh, how, maybe the question was, what, uh, uh, how far would you or should you bend the rules in order to avoid character? Yeah. Or do you think you should just roll with it? Yeah. Before, before any of us answer, because I know we have answers for this, was it last year? We did a panel where we talk about this a lot. I have a lot <laughs> of I think it was last this. year. Yeah, uh, I think it was two uh, years ago, actually. Two exactly. years ago, yeah. So that's on the MAGFest YouTube somewhere if you want to track it down. But uh, So I will say on this that that's something that should be established in your session zero. When you're talking about understanding the stakes of your story, understanding the stakes of your narrative, is death one of those stakes? Because there are a lot of ways to have bad stuff happen to your PCs that are not death. Um, I'm running an, I've been running an Urban Shadows campaign for a while, and death is always an option in Urban Shadows. But I am a parent of small children, and this is an Urban Shadows campaign where we're playing teenagers, and I don't want the death of children to be a theme in my game. So they might get hospitalized. They might get taken out. They might get sent off to some fucked up religious boarding school later and taken out of the plot in other ways. But we decided that character death is not going to be part of that. Um, there are other games where I think absolutely that's going to be a thing. In I believe in Never Ember's Enigma... Uh, what the uh, the heist game that uh, Andy is running, uh, that is definitely an option. And uh, if I 
screw up too bad if I go chasing after that security guard and, and get all up in his face like, I think you're doing a bad job. I'm probably going to get a boot to my face. <laughs> and I only have seven hit points. That's not going to end well. <laughs> I yeah. think it also depends to a degree on uh, you know, the system you're playing in and what death means in that context. Uh, is death the final word? For that character, is death the end of that story, uh, or you know, is it a situation where, for one reason or another, uh, death is not the end? No, I think that's a big deal. So when you have that initial establishment of like the narrative setting and say like, hey, we're playing a pillion, they're happy dragons, right? No one's going to die here. But okay, hey, we've toggled on death. That's a, that's a real thing. Now we're in an encounter where like those roles are happening, you're making death saving throws, someone's making medical checks, like they're trying to save that character, like by that point, hopefully you've had the discussions to be like, okay, we are dramatically at an apex that we talked about sessions ago. We're gonna roll this out and see how it plays, right? But I, if you can, I wouldn't say prevent a death, but just think about if you're not in that exact moment of that character is on the edge between life and death, if you're just looking at consequences. So a lot of consequences are better than death if you can pull them out there because they'll push the narrative forward. Uh, but if you're in that scene and they've been attacked and dying, roll it out if that's what your table's uh, discussed because it's going to build a lot of tension. But also, stop playing. <laughs> like, take, take a beat. Take a second. Uh, talk about it with the person, at the, maybe even as a table. Uh, I would encourage that. Uh, be, you know, it, most systems, there's an option for death, but it also leaves room for like, ah, maybe they're not dead. Maybe they get hospitalized. Maybe uh, they respawn, whatever. Um, D&D is the notable exception because you have the saving throws. And like Andy was saying, when you introduce rolling mechanics like that, you're kind of beholden to that. Otherwise, it's detracting from the, the stakes, right? So... I still find that even as you're getting uh, down to like the second death saving throw, the third death saving throw, just taking a second, pausing, checking in, again, you will be shocked to how many players are like, yeah, I'm ready. Yeah. Take me. <laughs> Whatever think. happens, I'm good with it. I can't tell you, I can't tell you how many mid-session DMs I've gotten that are like, you can kill my character. If you need to kill my character, you can kill my character. And I'm like, God damn. It ha it like, calm it's, down. We're not there yet. It happens yep. a lot. Uh, yep. The best thing for that, honestly, if you get to that, to that point, and I could do a whole panel on this, but the last piece is if that character's going down and this is a death scene, like, yeah. find a way to give that player a chance to do something epic on the way out if they can, right? Uh, like, there's a pulp system I play where if you die, you can die in an epic pulp death where you like do some amazing things save your friends and then go out in like a, a flash of glory right some systems support that very well some less so but if you ha have any opportunity to do that to give that little bit of like last call agency to that player it's going to make one that seem more memorable and more epic and two it's still going to push the narrative forward in a very compelling way because any character that can like be like hey i'll die but it saves my friends and they can run hell yeah you're a hero let's go right just because it's fun, I talked about Dread earlier and how when the tower falls, your character dies. Uh, another mechanic of Dread is that at any point, you can just knock the tower over, and then you sacrifice your character heroically. You get to do one really cool thing on your way out. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the last thing I was going to say on that before we... I think we have time for one more question after that was uh, kind of germane to Della's point, is that if you're going to ignore the mechanical rules, you should respect the narrative rules. And so I think the context is also important. Are they in a fight with a like a high threat bad guy uh, they, at a pivotal point in the story or did they just roll really badly when they got ambushed by goblins uh, that th th these things don't exist in a vacuum and they're always important to consider yes um, yeah so I think we have time for one more question I think it was you sir yes go ahead I'm very that concept but I always find it easier do you have any Okay, just to repeat the question for everyone, I'm um, saying the big fan of the concept of failing forward, but uh, finds it easier said than done. Do we have any uh, tips for uh, doing improvising that in the moment, or do we prep it beforehand? Um, uh, I think for me, it's kind of a combination of both. I usually try to kind of game out some situations beforehand to think to myself, okay, this is fairly critical. Uh, what do I do? if they 
either refuse to or are, or are unable to do this? Uh, what are my backup plans? I am kind of, uh, in several respects, uh, the opposite of a Chaos Goblin. I like to call it a Structure Kobold. Um, <laughs> Uh, my, 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 my game, my games are, my games are on rails, in fact, but they are very intricate labyrinthine rails that you will never perceive. Um, but I am sure the other GMs have some different approaches than I do. I said the big thing for that is, uh, kind of a hybrid as well, like either playing ahead or improvising in the context of the scene. The plan ahead is for like those big moments where I know like something like an arc is going to resolve. This is a, a, an epic battle. This is a important moment if failure occurs here what are the kind of things that would happen narratively that'll move the story along that still gives the players a chance to grip onto something and kind of ride out that success through the bad encounter uh in smaller moments it comes down to context and the biggest thing that i do to make that easier on myself because every single scene is different if you call for a role and the role has stakes you have to ask yourself, okay, if the player fails here, what am I going to do, right? Because that nat one's going to hit at some point. It's probably going to be at a very bad point for them or for you. And just thinking through, like, okay, if they just fall flat on their face in this moment, what can I do to prompt the next thing based on that character or one of the other characters or the scene or something to get, let them get back on their feet? Because let them face plant if it's, if it's part of the plot. Like, let it happen. But then have that answer for them. And maybe you gotta take 10 minutes and think about it. Maybe that's the end of your session for the night. They failed that epic moment and you gotta reset. But like, that gives you the opportunity to, to kind of get them moving back on track. I would say I, also, there's a big pressure on GMs to be able to always have an answer in the moment. It sucks. Uh, something I have learned to do is to say, I don't have a thing for that right now, but let me get back to you. And I promise that I will. Or... Does anyone have a thing for that? Does anyone have a thing for Ask that? Ask the table. Yeah. Uh, I, sorry. I, something I think that is in, when we're thinking about failing forward, I always think about um, going just straight up going back to improv class. Yes and, no but. Uh, how do you move things forward in that way? I usually ask myself a series of questions. What would be interesting? What would be relevant? What would be funny? And what would emotionally devastate someone? <laughs> uh, those yeah. are usually my, uh, my go-tos, especially if it's something where we want to move the plot forward. Um, some systems have those questions like built in, like, you know, uh, with like mixed successes um, or with failures like in... Uh, uh, Powered by the Apocalypse games will have like a, the GM will tell you how this effect is unstable or temporary. Um, so it's like, okay, that's now all I have to figure out is how the effect is unstable or temporary. Um, but in other systems, just asking yourself like, how can I make the impact of this felt and relevant or maybe funny or maybe emotionally devastating but still give them what they want or what they think they want. Well, we'll, we'll make good, a good point, too, about crowdsourcing options, right? Th that's great, because players will always suggest, at least in my experience, uh, much worse things than I would ever suggest of like, oh, here's how I'll get back on my feet, and here's what I'll, here's what I'll pay to succeed. And uh, that's wild, too. You get some good answers out of that. I plan. Uh, almost nothing, shockingly, uh, when I run a teacher RPG session. I run a lot of Powered by the Apocalypse, where one of the central philosophies is we're playing to find out what happens, which basically means that I'm finding out how the story is unfolding at the same time that you are. We're, cre we're creating it together. One of the things that's great about Powered by the Apocalypse is the failing forward mechanic is built in most of the time. When you fail a role, you get to mark an XP, a potential. It's called different things to different systems, but when you get like five of those, you get to unlock an advance. And so the best example... I can give a failing forward is from our um, oh our uh, Audioverse Award uh, finalist uh, Masks Actual Play podcast Academy H. Brendan plays in that, and uh, Brendan's character was uh, trying to save uh, two like supervillains uh, from exploding each other. Um, and got in the middle of them and tried everything in his power to like push them apart with uh, super strength. I'm too close to my microphone, I'm realizing. Um, push them apart with super strength, and uh, he failed. He failed that role, but that got him the last 
potential that he needed to unlock an advance. And with that advance, he chose to unlock the rest of his character's superpowers, which is a, uh, an option that you can choose in masks. So it resulted in this incredibly epic moment where he did not stop them from exploding, but he did uh, fly them into the air far above the city where uh, potentially there would not be as much damage done. I'm not going to tell you how that played out. You'll have to listen to the podcast. I'm, if I'm, you want I'm still not up. okay about it. I don't know why you felt like it was okay to bring that up. <laughs> <laughs> all right, unfortunately, yeah. I think that is about all the time that we yeah. have at this point. we got to make room for the next uh, panel. But thank you guys so much for coming out to see us today. hope you guys enjoy the rest of your MAGFest.